Good morning. It is great to be here today. I owe a great deal of thanks to Josh for speaking at the last minute. Josh, I'll try to give you a little bit more warning next time. Maybe, maybe an hour. <laughs> Just a few minutes. But I certainly want to thank each one of you who your prayers and sent me text messages. I greatly appreciate it. But let me ask you a question this morning. What on earth am I here for? You ever wonder about that? Do you ever get up some days and you're walking around, you know, what in the wide world am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? You know, are, are you here to live the American dream? Or to be happy, to be successful? Maybe to even rock and roll a little bit? To express yourself? Why are we here? You want to find out how to find our purpose? You know, I, I did a search in Google. You ever sit down at your computer and just Google up some things? It's, it's actually pretty interesting, but I actually Googled uh, purpose of life. And I found that you can go to a place that's called higherawareness.com and according to that website, to find your purpose. You draw it out of yourself. Others say you discover your dreams, go after your goals, aim high, believe you can achieve, you know, figure out what you're good at. But, you know, going Googling to find out how to find your purpose, you know, well, you may have a hard time finding the truth. You were made by God for God. You and I were made by God for God. You were put here for his purpose. And until we get that, until you and I really understand that, life isn't going to make sense. If you ask, is there a purpose for me? If you were to ask me that question, I might ask you, is your heart beating? You see, if your heart is still beating, then God has a purpose for you. What's the point? What's the point, David? There are two that I want to make. First, if you don't know something's purpose, if you don't know what it's for, it's likely to be abused. Why are so many people hurting themselves and hurting others today? Uh, we don't know our purpose. When you don't know the purpose of something, it's likely to be misused or even abused. You know, second, the only way to know your purpose in life is to consult the Creator. You can't listen to the crowd. You know, they'll, they'll confuse you. You can't look within. You don't have enough experience. You've got to talk to the owner. You've got to talk to the creator. The only way that you'll ever know your purpose in life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10. You know, you find your purpose by getting to know God. Brethren, it all starts with God. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in Him, and it finds its purpose in Him. Colossians 1, verse 16. If you want to know your purpose in life, start getting to know God. If you really want to know what your purpose is, you've got to start getting to know God. That's why we're excited that you're with us right now at the Seabury Church of Christ. Because we're on a journey to get to know God, and the more that we get to know God, the more that we will understand His ways and His wisdom. And the more that we understand His ways and His wisdom, the more that we will understand the meaning and the purpose of our lives. You know, watching the talk shows won't cut it. 
Sitting in the classrooms won't cut it. Going to seminars won't cut it. We must get to know God. Why? Why should we do that? Because it's all about God. So we're going to go to the designer. He is not hiding his purpose from us, but we've got to dig into the owner's manual for life, the Bible. He wants you to know his purpose. God has some challenging and fulfilling and life-changing plans for you and me. You know, there are three levels of living. There is the survivor level. Well, you got to turn it on, David. There you go. You can't live at the survival level, barely getting by, just existing. These are the people who are controlled by their circumstances. They put in their time at work and live for the weekend, just survival. And then you have the success level. And the success level, that's where most of the people in Kentucky are. By the world standards, we really got it made. We've got it made because we have a comfortable lifestyle compared to the rest of the world. We have freedom. We have possessions. We have, for the most part, good health. But in honest moments, we wonder, why did I still feel empty? Success. Then there's the significance level. We can live at the significance level not just survival or success, but significance. Question, how can I live at that level? People who are living at the level of significance know what on earth they are here for. You know God's purpose for your life and mine, and you're living them out. That's what gives us significance. Last week, or just a couple of weeks ago, we took a look at the big picture. And if it's a question of significance, why did God make us? He made us, if you remember, to be like Christ for his own glory. We talked about to God alone be the glory. Everything comes from him. Everything exists by his power and his intended for his glory. To him be glory evermore, Romans 11, verse 36. Then we ask the next logical question. If the purpose of my life is glorifying God, then how do I do that? How do I accomplish that? How can we glorify God? One way to answer this is by looking at how Jesus glorified God. Jesus glorified his Father by fulfilling his purpose. One, on one of his last nights on this planet, Jesus prayed to his Father, I have brought glory to you here on earth by doing everything you gave me to do. John 17, verse 4. Jesus fulfilled his Father's purpose for his life. Now we too can glorify God by fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. Let's review those purposes that we surveyed a few weeks ago. We were planned for God's pleasure, that's worship. We were formed for God's family, that's fellowship. We were created to be like Christ, that's discipleship. We were shaped for God's service, that's ministry. We were made for a mission, and that is evangelism. Now, we say around here that we exist to help people grow, to be passionate followers of Christ. That's our purpose, brethren, as a church. It's entirely consistent with what we're going to learn. Notice the emphasis on followers. Fulfilling God's purpose for our lives will help us become passionate followers of Christ. That's the way we walk in his steps. This week, 
I really was drawn to a very, very powerful, in my mind, and demanding few verses in the Bible that actually tells you and I what we need to do to walk in his steps, to be his passionate followers, to live out God's purpose for our lives. Let's read it. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and look at verses 57 through 62. And I've chosen today to read this from the English Standard Version. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Story that I'm sure that we're all very familiar with. It says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has, man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you. Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. Challenging. I think these are challenging, even stunning. And truth be told, disturbing. <laughs> Jesus doesn't make it easy for us, does he? He doesn't make it easy for us. What's it going to take for me to follow God's Son and find God's purpose? Jesus encountered three people who, if you will, for lack of a better term, think about it, they flirted with following him. What he said to them has been recorded for you and me. And what he said to them, he says to us today, three big ideas today come from these little six verses. Number one, I will count the cost. You know, a lot of people hear about the benefits of following Christ, and they want to sign up. Well, why wouldn't you? There's forgiveness. There's heaven and a purpose, and a meaning. But you don't get all that without paying a price. All of that comes with a price. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Luke 9, verse 57. At this time in Jesus' ministry, he was really popular. Crowds were hanging on to his every word. They liked the miracles that he performed. And so this man may be saying something, something like this. Hey, Jesus, following you sounds good. You know, sign me up. Maybe he's thinking, if I hang around Jesus now, I'll have a place of honor later. I like the lights. I like the crowds. I like the miracles. So he says, I like hanging around with you, Jesus. We're the center of attention. You're where it's at. Oh, he looks like a whatever, a wherever, and a whenever follower of Jesus. But he was more than likely expecting Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom. And Jesus sees what's in his heart. And what he's going to say to this guy who says, I will follow you. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There was no room in the inn when Jesus was born, and there's no place now for him to spend the night. Jesus is saying, think about the cost. Do you know what you're saying when you say you'll follow me? 
It's not going to be big crowds and prestigious positions and popularity. There's a cross to carry. See, this guy missed the implications of what it means to be a true follower of Christ. Don't miss this. If you want to follow Jesus and find your purpose, it will mean some hard things. It'll mean sacrifice, suffering, service, self-sacrifice, rejection, loneliness. All are part of the cost of following Jesus. Think about it. Jesus died and he rose. That's the basis for our forgiveness. That's the heart of the truth. Jesus died and rose. If we're truly going to follow him, we must experience a death and a resurrection. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. There are no shortcuts in following Christ and fulfilling our purpose. We die to self, and then we fulfill our purpose. Death. I die to fulfilling my own purpose for my life. Resurrection. I live to fulfill God's purpose for my life. No shortcuts. You can't say, I want to get it quick and easy. There has to be a death to self. Moses' life was transformed by 40 days on Mount Sinai. Jesus was empowered for ministry by spending 40 days in the desert. The disciples were transformed by the 40 days with Jesus after his resurrection. What's it going to take for me to follow God's son and God's purpose? Brethren, I don't know about you, but I am telling you I am willing to count the cost. And number two, I will put Christ first. Who or what is in first place in your life? Jesus has a radical way of expressing what's in first place in your life. Let's look at the second conversation in these verses. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Luke chapter 9, verse 59. Some scholars say that the fact that this guy is here ha hanging around Jesus is an indication that his dad isn't dead yet. His dad is more than likely sick, so he's able to come and hear Jesus speak. Presumably, Jesus is also teaching close to his home where this man lived. There's no evidence in the words here that the, that the dad is already dead. What the man may be saying is this, after my sick father dies and after the funeral, then I'll come. He is impressed by Jesus, but he's not ready to follow him immediately. I'll join you after my father's funeral. Do you see his indecision and his delay? Do you? This man has a priority over Jesus. What is Jesus going to say to this guy? Well, and Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as far as you go and proclaim the kingdom of God, Luke 9, verse 60. You know, the spiritually dead should bury the physically dead. It seems like Jesus is heartless, doesn't it? You know, that he doesn't care about the grief process. However, we know he was deeply moved when Mary and John were at the foot of the cross when he died and the overall teaching of the Bible is that care and respect and honor be shown to those who have passed away here Jesus has tailored an answer that this man needed from Jesus to conclude from these words that we must never attend funerals including your own family uh, members funerals is not what this is about Jesus often uses radical statements to make a point. He's making his point about what it means to put him first. He's looking for a radical, revolutionary change in this man's priorities and in ours. 
He's not looking to be resident within us. He's lo looking to be persistent within us. In the nearest and dearest relatives we have are standing in our way to keep us from following Christ. It's necessary that we have a zeal that will cause us to love Jesus more than we love them. God wants your whole life. There's not a single verse in the Bible that says you can live your life any old way you want to. God wants all of you. He doesn't want 10% or 50% or 99%. He wants all of you. God is very clear about this. Give yourself completely to God since you have been given new life and use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. Romans 6 verse 13. It should be all of you. C.S. Lewis once said this, <coughs> Christianity, if false, is of no importance and if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. If this is really true, it deserves everything that you've got. It's either all or nothing. It's either true and should determine the rest of our life. Or we should just all chuck it and go do whatever we want to. A lot of people say, I have my social life. I have my career, my recreational life, my family life, and over here, I have my spiritual life. If that's, if that, it's like they are saying God is a piece of my life. He's one part of the pie. Wrong. God permeates the whole pie. He wants the whole pie to be under his control. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Matthew 6, verse 24. It is impossible to have two number one priorities in your life. You're always going to have a number one, a number two, a three, four, five. You can't have two number one priorities. Let me let you in on a life-changing truth. To grow, you must learn to say no. You can't say yes to everything. You have to say no to some things. You have to know, say no often to good things so that you can have time for the best things. If you are serious about following Jesus and fulfilling your purpose for life, you have to make space for God in your life. And if you're going to make space for God in your life, you're going to have to cut out some stuff. You can put only so many irons in the fire before you put out the fire. Your life is already overcrowded, but not everything in your life is equal value. So you need to ask, what am I going to stop doing? Anytime you take on a new challenge, you should say, what am I going to do? There are some things you ought to procrastinate about. You know, because they're just not worth doing. They're not bad. They're just some more important things that should be done if you're going to grow spiritually. Maybe you're going to have to give up an hour a week of TV. Maybe you'll need to cut back on your physical workout so that you can focus on your spiritual workout. There's always a cost of putting Christ first in your schedule. But the rewards are worth it. What's it going to take for me to follow God's Son and find God's purpose? Well, again, I will put Christ first. Number three, I won't look back. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Luke 9, verse 61. One scholar says that this man may have had the desire to set in order his family affairs and then get rid of some material things. After that, he's all set to follow Jesus. Again, Jesus knows what's in this man's heart. Maybe Jesus knew that his family members would try and talk him out of following Christ, and they can be very persuasive. Here's the challenge from Jesus. 
And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, verse 62. Trying to plow forward while looking backward gives you a crooked fur. You know, plowing in one direction while looking in other directions will never work. Do that and you'll be fit for following Jesus? No. This man is distracted and he's divided. Jesus says, I want you to be focused. I don't want you to look back at what you've given up. If you look back at the worldly life I'm calling you to leave, then you aren't fit for being my follower. I want you to look forward to where we're going. Once you begin life with me, you keep on coming with me. No turning back. What's it going to take for me to follow God's son and God's purpose? I will not look back. I will count the cost. I will put Christ first. I will not look back. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Are you a true follower of Christ? You ask yourself that question. Are you a true follower of Christ? Has there been a death and a resurrection in your life? You know, I read an article about some young adults being baptized recently. One of the young men being baptized, his name was Jason Newhaus. The need to find out the answer to the question, what on earth am I here for, was something God used to draw him to Jesus. I, I want you to take a look just for a moment at, at, at just some of what this article said. He said, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? If you aren't sure of this, the preacher there said, I'd like the privilege of leading you in prayer to settle the issue. And he asked this young man, the others that were there, he said, let's bow our heads. And I am going to pray a prayer, and you can pray it in your own heart. And the preacher began this prayer, and he said, Dear God, I want to know your purpose for my life. I don't want to waste the rest of my life on the wrong things. I want a death to my old selfish way of living. That's sin. I know I deserve your judgment for that, so I turn from it. I want a resurrection in my life. I want to know you and follow you. Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but as much as I know how, I open my life to you. I believe you died for me, for my sins in my place. I believe you're alive right now. I ask you to come into my life and make yourself real to me. Help me to study your word and help me to understand what you made me for. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen. You know, if this young man, if this young man prayed that prayer and meant business with God, confessed his name and was baptized for the remission of sins, he will see changes in his life, in attitudes and actions. He will be saying, I will count the cost. Put Christ first and not look back. You know, I think that there is a point to ponder. The pursuit of a purpose requires the payment of a price. There's a verse to remember, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There is a question to consider. What will I say no to in order to fulfill God's purpose for my for my life. Some of you are seekers, just checking things out. I'm not even sure I buy this, but I'm intellectually honest enough to check it out. That's great. We're glad to have you on this journey. Some of you are stumblers. You'd say, I call myself a Christian, but I'm not really very close to God. And I have been really honestly living for my own plans and not God. This is a good time for you to come home. Some of you are strong in the faith, and you can go deeper with God and bring others along too. George Herbert said, it's never too late to be who you might have been. In some Christians, you know, there were some Christians uh, recently in the area of Cleveland, Ohio, that went around and did some 
videos of people. And when they asked, what's the purpose of life? One man said, do something with your life that will outlast it. That's not bad, is it? So the question is, do you know God's purpose for your life? Do you want to know? In closing, I think there are some questions that we need to ask ourselves. At what level of living life are we? Are we at the survivor level, just getting by? Are we at the success level, to think we have it made? Are we at the significance level, and we know God's purpose for our lives? Am I willing to count the cost? put Christ first, and not look back. How we answer these questions should answer how you respond to the Lord's invitation. Have you confessed his name and been baptized for the remission of sins? If not, why not now? What would your answer be? If you have been baptized for the remission of sins but have not been willing to pay the price, nor to put Christ first, and you keep looking back. You think you have it made, but your life seems empty. Won't you come now and ask God for forgiveness and start your purpose for life, and that is glorifying and praising God in the life that you live. Again, what will your answer be while we stand and sing? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise His name, praise His name, praise His name.